Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Dizzy's Club Coca-Cola here at Jazz at Lincoln Center here in New York City. Trumpeter, band leader, and composer Nicholas Payton understands the past, the present, and the future of jazz music. Not only has he had a historical approach to the music, but he continues to add his voice as a band leader as well as a composer. Tonight we're going to talk about this latest project here at Dizzy's with the big band the presence of jazz music and how he sees this music going in the future. <laughs> that out there tonight I don't know you tell me a combination of the Nicholas Payton sextet sonic trance the quartet and oh my god Ty Damron Oliver Nelson a little hip-hop out there also oh, yeah, a lot of it you know I'm, I'm just basically trying to bring all the things that I love in music period into it you know what I mean I mean that's a lot of that's a lot of music yeah but you know like to me that's if I can't do that and, and, and be relevant then to me what's the point you know um, you know I grew up in New Orleans uh, very strongly tied to that tradition you know um, my father who passed recently you know being a bassist playing on a lot a lot of early hits like uh, working in the coal mine and Aaron Neville, uh, Tell It Like It Is, and, and then playing stand-up bass with bands like the Preservation Hall Band and with cats like Thomas Jefferson, who was referenced in, in uh, Miles' autobiography. I think Miles used to suffer Thomas, but he was a bad New Orleans trumpet player out of the Armstrong tradition. So, man, I'm trying to bring, go from that, the whole, the complete continuum of everything that I've loved in music, from classical to rock, hip-hop, blues, funk, all of it, and just try to create something that's cohesive and a, and 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 that that encompasses everything that I love and that I've heard, you know. I understand that this took a little while because every group and every unit that you've had, you've recorded or you have some kind of documentation, but now this is the first time that the world is getting ready to see and hear the Nicholas Payton Big Band in America. Um a lot of these uh, tunes and, and, and uh, arrangements were recorded for uh, a German radio band, which uh, shall remain nameless. But uh, I took a lot of that stuff and adapted it for this group. But this is the first time really working the material here and really having it develop 
with uh, so many brilliant talents and improvisers. It's taking on another shape. Now you are stepping in the role of band leader. You always have, right. but now you are arranging, you are writing intricate parts for the oboe, the alto, the, I mean, even the percussion. Where are you musically and how hard is that for you right now? It's, it's almost like, uh, you know, maybe somebody gives you some primary colors, you know, and, and, and then they say, okay, now you have the whole 64 box of Crayolas. It, it the, the more musicians, it just expands the amount of color I'm able to deal with. Having a guitar, you know, we talk about notes, that's one thing. Talking about how you arrange the notes. Um, now specifically, a lot of the arrangements, some of the things that we did from Into the Blue, and some of the things that we did from the uh, leaked Bitches mixtape, are direct transcriptions of voicings of either myself or Kevin Hayes, who played on Into the Blue. So I just arranged that for the, orchestrated that for the ensemble, uh, much in the way that uh, Gil Evans did for Miles Davis when he orchestrated Ahmad Jamal's direct voicings and dispersed that amongst the mem members of the band. Now, harmony is one thing, it, it, you know, if we look at that, how, how that goes um, vertically. But when you talk about, well, how does the piccolo sound blended with the Fender Rhodes and the guitar, the textures, the amount of textures, you just increase that and with every person. Then on top of that, when you say, okay, that's one thing, but I have five trumpets, so when I give this note to Freddie Hendrix, or when I give this note to them, then you start blending with personalities, and that's a whole other aspect of arranging. So the possibilities are just wide open for you to do so many different things, and, and that's what's so interesting about it to me. This band is really a beautiful hodgepodge of the past, the present, and the future. We have Bob Hurst on bass, mm -hmm. we have Patience Higgins, and then we have the next generation. We have Chelsea Baraz, and we have, I mean, and I'm not, she's phenomenal on this. You, again, had to know musically the musicians you wanted for this. Definitely, and I feel we're making a lot of statements on a cultural level, on a sexual level, on a musical level. Um, you know, the fact that I have a, a large group of women in the ensemble, which was decidedly done, it balances out sort of a lot of that yang energy in the group. You know, and it gives us a different edge than just the traditional, in your, you know, 
big band, the fact that I omitted the, we don't even have a piano on the stage, and just dealing with the Fender Rhodes, that gives us a different color. And then we had the guitar to it. You know, I was real specific in not only the, the, the voices in terms of instruments, but who I wanted to play. Uh, many of these relationships are personal relationships that have ex extended back as far as 15, 20 years in some cases. So you're hearing a lot of love and you're hearing a sense of community and family, which to me is the essence of, of, of where the music is. And we're just trying to, we're not departing from any of the other traditions. We're using that as a foundation and trying to build up and trying to illustrate how all these different things that we have, all these categor categorizations are just illusions that essentially there's a certain rhythmic and harmonic code that exists at the f foundation of all these these musics. And if you can tap into that, you tap into something very personal and at the same time universal. And, and that's ex essentially what we're trying to do here. Touching on the Fender Rhodes, I heard a little Dilla mm -hmm. on the hip hop end. Mm -hmm. I heard a little Moody Man. Mm -hmm. I heard some producers that are relevant in hip hop and other forms of popular music that you have fused into hard bop. Mm -hmm. Definitely, like like with Dilla, man, what he did with the, the shuffle beat, what he did with swing is essentially like what I feel like cats from back in the day were doing. Uh, the instrument is different. He He's using an, 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 an MPC 3000, whereas, you know, uh, a cat like Roland Guerrero, he's using actual percussion. So we're synthesizing all these different dynamics to try to make one whole that is 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 uh, that encompasses sort of a lot of different elements and funnels it to to, to, to s some type of singular vision or voice. Um, yeah, I, I don't think ultimately. The things that the cats were doing back in the ragtime era are significantly different from the cats who were dealing in the hip-hop era. We're dealing with syncopation, we're dealing with rhythm, we're dealing with a cultural feeling that comes from the streets, we're dealing with the blues, and that's really no different than what we're, we're doing tonight. <laughs> that I really really admire about what you do throughout your career is bridging the past the present and the future you have had the opportunity to be trained and groomed and also learn from Doc Cheatham and Clark Terry to Elvin Jones and Ellis Mar Marcellus mm -hmm. and now what I'm seeing you doing on this bandstand is passing it down to these musicians that are in your big band I feel an obligation, uh, perhaps now more so than more so than ever, to do that because there's so many cats who never heard Art Blakey before. I got a chance to share the bandstand with him: Elvin Jones, Hank Jones, Ray Brown, Doc Cheatham. You know, for many of the younger musicians, I am their link to to that generation of musicians, and having been the beneficiary of so many hours of those guys' times, I remember. Uh, I went on the tour sometime in the mid-90s with um, George Ween's Newport All-Stars, and it was um, 
A. Jones on bass, Butch Miles from the Count Basie Orchestra, Clark Terry, uh, Al Gray, um, George Wien was on piano. And just being on the bus, you know, those couple of weeks with those guys and the stories they would tell. So after a while I got hip enough, me and Eddie Jones, Eddie Jones, uh, the bassist uh, from Count Basie, was my uh, hanging partner. In every new city we would go, we would find a record store and he would come with me. And I would just buy these records. And, and a big part of the, the enjoyment for me was putting on records that a lot of these cats were on or knew about and just watching them vibe out on the projects and tell different stories about this cat and that cat, the Newport gig at uh, uh, in 56 with Duke Ellington, hearing the story that the one that came out on Columbia was not the official release that they actually re-recorded in the studios. Things like that, like you wouldn't know otherwise if you were with the cats. And so having that connection, to me, I feel somewhat of an obligation, but not, not in a... Um, in a sense that I feel like it's too much, but uh, it inspires me to be able to share what I know uh, with uh, those who haven't had the privilege of meeting a lot of the guys that I, I spent some time with. <laughs> talked about you singing and I noticed that tonight again you did that with the sextet but you now have more elaborate arrangements surrounding your voice mm -hmm. I bet that was spooky also Man, it's just fun is you're just dealing with more it's just more possibilities so it's like so many different types of things that you can do to me so I I don't look at it at, look at it as a restriction because usually with a big band the vibe is that it's uh, more hev heavily orchestrated and somehow it takes away from the improvisational element. So really, what my goal was is to craft a large ensemble that still had the feel of a small ensemble, that sense of spontaneity. <laughs> How do you think the record label, Nonsuch, is going to respond to a project like this? Because now we're at a time where, one, touring with a big band is economically expensive 
and two we've been so homogenized with just hard bop or just straight ahead or just traditional jazz that this is very fresh and innovative how do you think they're going to take this and how do you think the fans are going to react to this well uh i've long since uh not been on none such uh since the end of the blue project uh, i've since signed with columbia uh did a record uh that was due to be released several times and finally was decided by the uh, executives that uh, it would not be released. Uh, so finally it got leaked on the internet entitled Bitches. Uh, very, a project, in, uh, many of the arrangements uh, tonight came from that project. Uh, you Are the Spark. Um, so many uh, other arrangements came from that project. Um, it's interesting because it's really caused me my 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 uh, musical vision has caused me to face the reality of what a musician has to deal with in in the society you know oftentimes uh, i blog a lot I'm, I'm on facebook i'm on twitter um and i feel that there's a resistance to anything that that promotes creative thinking in this country uh people to be individuals everything is sort of anti that and I've I've sort of taken a, a harder stance than ever to promote individualism, to promote freedom of expression, to promote being able to to have respect for your elders, but at the same time having your own unique voice. Uh, and it, it's been interesting because there's a resistance from the establishment to do that. I mean, this this is supposed to be so-called jazz music where you have improvisers, and it's supposed to be a freedom of expression. But if you look at it. You know, you go to most jazz festivals, first of all, most of the music there is not swinging. It's, it's, it's like rock or pop or R&B. Um, most of the projects are concept projects. It's tribute to Ella Fitzgerald or tribute to someone else who's dead. Or it's an all-star band. Uh, many of the great bands who tour every year are essentially all-star bands. If you look at the lineup, they're guys who could be leaders themselves. And we've gotten away from the whole idea that a cat could have a band like Miles Davis and have some upstarts in the group that no one's ever heard of but are phenomenally talented. You know, one of the greatest selling recordings ever uh, within this genre is Miles Davis' is Kind of Blue. Now it looks like an all-star band, but at that time what we don't realize is that was just Miles' band. Bill Evans hadn't really struck out on his own yet, Cannonball Adderley, you know, uh, train. train. Yeah. yeah, he. They. They were in. They were side men. Uh, you know, but now people try to recreate that vibe. In essence, uh, what I think is has been forgotten is that we've become haunted by the ghosts of the past of this music, and it's actually served as more as a, of a restriction than a freedom. And a big reason why this is important to me, a uh, big. Uh, uh, significance of us playing opposite of the Jazz and Lincoln Center Ensemble. To me, to be in Columbus Circle in the Time Warner building playing this music that is sort of anti-establishment in a place that is very much the establishment, to me is somewhat a part of the story. That I'm saying that at all costs um, this has to live and somebody has to hold it down. Being from New Orleans, you know, having a father who passed last year, uh, my, my first trumpet mentor, Clyde Kerr, all these guys who are no longer with me, the Turbenton brothers, I feel more, more of a sense of dedication to preserve what I feel I, that I benefited from. And I feel at this point, they, they all live through me, Doc Cheatham, Ray Brown, Elvin Jones. Uh, I feel a, a sense of responsibility to preserve not only the things that they taught me, but to live out my life through my art through my art. You know, what sense does it make? Yeah, I could take some quick money and do a Louis Armstrong tribute gig and, and, and stand to make tons more money than, than if I would do a thing with just my band, with my sextet, original music. That's not the point. It, it, I didn't get out into this for an economical reason. I got into it because I love it and I have, uh, I feel as, uh, I want to share that love with the people. And to me, in this day and age of everybody wanting something quick, uh, being able to produce something to the masses uh, quickly without care for quality. People don't care about quality anymore, and mediocrity has become king. And uh, I'm trying to be 
the antithesis of what that idea is and to say that quality can exist and still be appealing. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Dizzy's Club Coca-Cola here at Jazz at Lincoln Center here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Nicholas Payton for his time as well as the staff and management here at Dizzy's. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace. <laughs> Thank you.